Number 9. Nicholas Foreman. 24-year-old Nicholas Foreman and his girlfriend, 22-year-old Sabrina Haruni, were on their way home from watching the Super Bowl at a local bar last year when Sabrina received a text message from an ex-boyfriend. The Uber driver who took the couple to Foreman's home in Parkinman Township, Pennsylvania, would later tell authorities that a vicious argument broke out between the two. The fight continued after they were dropped off. By then, the Uber driver had become so concerned for Sabrina's safety that he stayed in the driveway for a few minutes. Foreman allegedly demanded to see his girlfriend's phone, telling her that he wouldn't let her leave until he saw it. The noise and fighting eventually appeared to have stopped. Figuring everything had calmed down, the Uber driver left. What had actually happened was horrific and tragic. Foreman beat Sabrina to death and recorded a video of himself taunting her while she was unresponsive, stating, This is what a cheating liar gets. The next day, he ordered an Uber, loaded Sabrina's body into the car, and had the driver take them to the hospital, where she was pronounced dead. Foreman told police that three women had attacked her, but they didn't buy the story. He was convicted of first-degree murder and received a life sentence. Number 8. Svetlana Boyranova while barbecuing with some friends in Russia's Chelyabinsk region in 2019, 27-year-old Svetlana Boyranova began accusing her boyfriend, Evgeny Solyanik, of cheating on her. This was nothing new. Boyranova frequently hurled allegations of infidelity at Solyanik, who consistently denied having a wandering eye. But Svetlana took things too far that day. She allegedly threw rocks at her boyfriend and then threw herself on top of him. Then she stabbed him in the chest with a two-foot-long, 61-centimeter skewer. Svetlana immediately pulled the skewer out and took Solyanik to the hospital, where he was treated and released. The couple went back to the gathering and continued their day as usual. By the following morning, the injured man's condition had worsened to the point where Svetlana rushed him back to the emergency room. As it turned out, his heart and lungs were punctured from the attack. Doctors performed emergency surgery, but it was too late to save Solyanik's life. He died during the procedure. Svetlana confessed to stabbing her boyfriend and was charged with manslaughter. She received a six-and-a-half-year prison sentence and was ordered to compensate the victim's family. The crazed killer argued in court that doctors were responsible for Solyanik's death because they had failed to treat him properly. But it was clear that Svetlana had a severe jealousy problem. In fact, it wasn't the first time she had stabbed a man. She apologized to Solyanik's family in court, but for them, her remorseful words were too little, too late. Number 7. Stephanie Lazarus. Sherry Rasmussen and her husband, John Rutan, were only married for a few months before she was found dead in the couple's home in 1984. Someone had beaten her and shot her three times in the chest at point-blank range. Police originally surmised that Sherry was murdered in a robbery gone wrong, but her family pushed them to look into other possibilities. Sherry's father, Nels, told detectives that John's ex-girlfriend, LAPD officer Stephanie Lazarus, had been harassing Sherry in the time leading up to her death. Investigators turned a blind eye to the lead, and the case went cold. Nels tried to get some of the evidence DNA tested, but it had gone missing. The LAPD's Cold Case Homicide Unit reviewed the case in 2001 and found the missing evidence. They tested it for DNA, but Lazarus continued to fly under the radar until 2009, when a keen-eyed detective thoroughly reread the file. Stephanie's DNA was matched to the crime scene. She went to work one morning as a high-ranking member of the agency's art theft department and ended the day in police custody. Court proceedings revealed that Lazarus and Rutan had a casual sexual relationship until he met Sherry. When Lazarus heard that he planned to marry his new girlfriend, she lost her mind. She was never able to let go of what had been nothing more than a fling to Rutan, and she took her dysfunction out on Sherry, who did nothing wrong and paid with her life. Number 6. Wallop Huai Hong Thong. Nafathorn Kanaka Semsafon was a beautiful 23 year old Thai woman who dated men for money in the sex tourism capital of Pattaya. The allowances she received from her mostly foreign benefactors afforded her a nice lifestyle, which included plastic surgery, designer clothes, and a brand new Honda Civic. The divorcee also used her earnings to support her two children. 
She also had a Thai boyfriend named Wallop Huai Hong Thong. The pair had been dating for about a year when he found out about Navathorn's secret lifestyle and money sources in 2018. Wallop was so angry, he tracked the woman down and allegedly fired six bullets into her head while she sat in the front seat of her car. Text messages in Nafathorn's phone showed that Wallop had asked her to meet in person the day he shot her to death. He had promised to leave Nafathorn alone for good if she would just see him one more time. Then, he drove three hours outside of Pattaya to commit the horrifying crime. Police said that they believed Wallop was motivated by jealousy, I wonder what gave it away, and issued a warrant for his arrest. Unfortunately, there appear to be no updates on the case, leaving us to wonder what price, if any, Wallop is paying for his disturbing deed. Number 5. Joe Atkinson 24-year-old Poppy Devi Waterhouse was a talented mathematician who lived in Leeds, England with her 25-year-old boyfriend, Joe Atkinson. They had been together for three years when she decided she wanted to move on romantically. Although Waterhouse and Atkinson were broken up, they continued to live together while they figured out their next step. Atkinson struggled to accept the breakup, even though both he and Waterhouse had both started seeing other people. As the reality sank in that the relationship was truly over, he reached his boiling point. After a night out during the holidays, he returned home and attacked Poppy with a knife in a jealous rage, stabbing her 70 times. He tried to clean up the crime scene and threw his bloody clothes away before calling the police. Atkinson argued that he killed Waterhouse in self-defense, but his story didn't hold up to scrutiny. After all, as the prosecution pointed out, if he was innocent, he wouldn't have seen a reason to try disposing of evidence and cleaning up the mess. Atkinson was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 16 years. Poppy's loved ones are fighting to strengthen sentencing laws, which automatically dictate a lesser sentence if the crime occurs inside the home. Did you know that domestic crimes automatically receive lesser sentences in the UK if committed inside the home? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and make sure to like and subscribe as well for more content. Number 4. Sarah Williams and Katrina Wall Ian Johnson found himself struggling to choose between two women after he reconciled with his longtime partner, 60-year-old Sadie Hartley, following some time apart. During their separation, Johnson had slept with 35-year-old Sarah Williams. He kept in touch with her even after he and Johnson had resumed their relationship, and their correspondence was more than cordial. The pair occasionally sexted and exchanged explicit photographs, and Johnson had no idea that he was feeding into a dangerous obsession, even though he had broken up with Williams because of her possessive and controlling ways. The envious ex-lover couldn't let go of her hope that she and Johnson would end up back together, and if she had to force his hand in the matter, then so be it. She believed that if she eliminated Hartley from the equation, the relationship she wanted so badly would fall into place. For nearly 18 months, Williams and her friend Katrina Walsh plotted Hartley's murder. They even did a practice run before finally acting on their plans in 2016. Williams entered Hartley's home in Lancashire, England, and paralyzed her with a cattle prod that she had purchased in Germany just for the occasion. Then she stabbed her victim 41 times. But she never got the fairy tale ending she had hoped to achieve through her gruesome act. Police quickly caught up with Williams and Walsh and charged them with murder. They were both convicted and received life sentences. Number 3. Daniel William 20-year-old Samantha Shelley Nance had no idea that she was knocking on death's door by dating her first boyfriend, Nathan Shuck, in 2009. The two had only been together for two months when Shelley's roommate found her dead in her bed. She had been stabbed 42 times and there were no signs of forced entry, indicating that the crime was extremely personal. Police focused on Shelley's circle in their search for the killer. At first, they suspected Nathan of being involved, but he had an alibi and investigators couldn't establish a realistic motive. The picture became clearer when witnesses told detectives about mounting tensions between Shelley and Nathan's roommate, Daniel William. Daniel was romantically attracted to Nathan and had become increasingly jealous as he spent more time with Shelley. It was no secret that he disliked his love interest's girlfriend. 
The day before Shelley's death, Daniel had texted her repeatedly, asking about her whereabouts. He was also seen on surveillance footage buying hair dye, soap, and gloves at a local Walmart. Daniel admitted to being at Shelley's apartment on the day of her murder, but claimed he was there to visit someone else. In the meantime, his history of anger issues surfaced. Police learned that while serving in the Navy, Daniel had asked to be removed from his ship because he feared losing his temper and attacking his superiors. Feeling they had enough evidence to secure a conviction, the authorities charged Daniel with Shelley's murder. He was found guilty and will spend the rest of his life in prison. Daniel continues to maintain his innocence from behind bars and has unsuccessfully appealed his conviction. Number 2. Christina Paulilla After her father died when she was just a toddler, Christina Paulilla was raised by a single mother who struggled with drug addiction. From there, she ended up at her grandparents' house. Christina was also bullied at school for a hair loss condition she suffers from called alopecia. In other words, to say that she had a rough childhood may be an understatement. But most people, even those with incredibly difficult lives, know that it's wrong to take emotional problems out on others. Paulilla apparently lacked that awareness when she befriended two popular girls at her Texas high school named Tiffany Rowell and Rachel Colorautis. They helped the troubled teen improve her appearance and fit in better with the student body. Things seemed to be getting better for Paulilla, who was voted most irresistible in her 2003 yearbook. But then, she started experimenting with drugs and dating a 21-year-old man named Christopher Lee Snyder. Their relationship was tempestuous due to Paulilla's jealousy issues. One night, she even went to Snyder's family's home and threatened to kill them. The dysfunctional couple decided to rob Colorautis and Rowell, who they knew had a drug stash in their possession. Snyder shot the two young women, along with Rowell's boyfriend and his cousin. Colorautis initially survived and was trying to reach a phone to dial 911 when Paulilla beat her in the head repeatedly with the butt of a 38 caliber revolver. The young killer immediately reported to her job at Walgreens after committing the heinous act, behaving as if nothing had happened. Nearly three years went by without any leads until police received an anonymous tip pointing them in Paulilla's direction. By then, she and Snyder had broken up. She'd been to rehab and relapsed and was married to a fellow addict who she went into hiding with. They spent eight months on the run at a motel as their habits grew. Paulilla was spared the death penalty because she was a minor when she and Snyder murdered her friends in cold blood. She was convicted on four counts of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison. It is possible that she'll see freedom again, however, when she becomes eligible for parole in 2046 at age 60. Number 1. Melanie Smith Many of us have seen a happy couple and wish that we could experience their bliss, especially during times of heartbreak or when our own romantic lives are otherwise ailing. But for a select few, that stinging envy transforms into uncontrollable jealousy. This was certainly the case for Melanie Smith, a woman from Wales who couldn't stand seeing her upstairs neighbors, Lee Ann Shears and Liam Timbrell, enjoying the type of relationship that she wanted for herself. Smith had a boyfriend, but she strongly suspected that he was cheating. She also struggled with a drinking problem, which certainly didn't help her mental state. Instead of pursuing a healthier connection with someone else or focusing on improving her own life in any way, Smith burned the apartment building down. She had overheard Shears and Timbrell having sex, and it drove her off the deep end, especially since Smith and her boyfriend weren't getting along that night. Consumed by rage, she set fire to a stroller that the neighbors kept in the hallway, and soon enough, the building was engulfed in flames. Shears and Timbrell died in the blaze, along with Shears' young son and her niece and nephew. Society was so sickened by Smith's actions, even her own children labeled her the most evil woman in Britain. She won't see freedom again until she spent at least 30 years behind bars. Number 10. The Star of David The Star of David, also known as the Magan David, which means Shield of David in Hebrew, is the most identifiable symbol of Judaism in the modern world. Just like the sign of the cross is the universal symbol of Christianity, 
the Star of David is often worn by Jews and appears on the Israeli flag. But the Magan David wasn't always an exclusively Jewish symbol. It was the Jewish community of Prague in what is now the Czech Republic that adopted the Star of David as their official symbol in the 17th century. Before that, this symbol had a history that spanned countries, cultures, and religious beliefs. Long before the Jewish faith and Zionists adopted the symbol, the Magan David appeared in ancient Eastern cultures. The Buddhists used the symbol of the six-pointed star to represent peace and harmony, and it can still be found in decorative works. The six-pointed star was also a popular symbol in pagan traditions, was used often decoratively in churches built during the first century, and was also used occasionally in Muslim culture. So, while we may be surprised to see this now universally acknowledged symbol of Judaism in places like ancient Christian churches, mosques, Buddhist temples, or pagan ritual sites, before the 17th century Jews of Prague, this was completely normal, and in some places remains the case today. Number 9. Mark Twain and Halley's Comet There's something oddly spooky about celestial bodies making predictable passes in plain view of the casual observer looking up at the night sky. This idea is no different when it comes to Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet was first discovered in 1758 by English astronomer Edmund Halley. It visibly passes the Earth every 74 to 75 years. It was last seen in 1986 and won't be seen again until 2061. Okay, so that's the basic rundown, but where's the coincidence in a predictable comet? Oddly enough, in 1835, Samuel Clemens, aka Mark Twain, was born. The same year, Halley had made her pass by the Earth, burning her bright blue light into the sky. While Mark Twain was well known as one of the greatest American authors and humorists that ever put pen to paper, he was also a touch of a fortune teller with this now famous quote, I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It is coming again next year, and I expect to go out with it. It will be the greatest disappointment of my life if I don't go out with Halley's Comet. The Almighty has said, no doubt. Now, here are these two unaccountable freaks. They came in together, they must go out together. And by the sheer power of coincidence, he was correct. Twain died a year later in 1910 from a heart attack only a day after Halley's brightest day. There are a slew of other theories and predictions based on Halley's Comet, but that's for another video. Number 8. The Unsinkable Woman Violet Constance Yesup, born October 2, 1887, was considered the unsinkable woman after surviving three extreme naval disasters. By winning the worst lottery fate could offer, she was aboard the RMS Olympic in 1911, the RMS Titanic in 1912, and somehow the HMS Britannic 1916, when they all suffered horrible accidents. Every single ship was owned by the transatlantic ship company White Star, where reluctantly, Jessup got a job as a stewardess. During the fifth crossing of the Olympic, Jessup experienced her first major accident at sea. The largest ship of its time crashed into the HMS Hawk, poking holes in the Olympics watertight compartments like tissue paper. Thankfully, although no one aboard was injured or killed, some could consider the event an omen for Jessup's career at sea. However, Jessup was undeterred, and a few friends convinced her to join up with White Star's brand new ship, the Titanic. Thanks to a fairly famous movie, we all know what happens next aboard the Titanic. However, Jessup's story is a touch different from the movie's Jack and Rose. This is what Jessup recalled about that fateful night. I was ordered up on deck, calmly passing and strolled about. I stood at the bulkhead with the other stewardesses, watching the women cling to their husbands before being put into the boats with their children. Sometime after, a ship's officer ordered us into the boat. First, to show some women it was safe. As the boat was being lowered, the officer called, Here, Miss Jessup, look after this baby! And a bundle was dropped onto my lap. Jessup was rescued roughly eight hours after the sinking of the Titanic and, amazingly, went back to work at sea with the British Red Cross as a nurse during the First World War. While aboard the Britannic, the ship was hit by an underwater mine and began sinking rapidly. Jessup jumped to a lifeboat without the order of the captain and somehow survived. Jessup continued working at sea for another 43 years and died in 1971 at the age of 83. Talk about a wild history on the water. Do you think you'd go back to working as a ship's crew member after all of that? Number 7. Brothers in Arms The Great War or World War I 
was one of the bloodiest conflicts known to man, with an estimated 40 million people killed during the various World War I battles across the globe. It's only fitting that the first and last British soldiers to be killed be buried right next to one another. Private John Parr was the first British soldier to be killed in the war. Historians actually disagree on the exact cause of his death. However, it is genuinely agreed that he died from German rifle fire while searching for a missing unit. While his body was never officially identified, we do know that he was only 14 when he joined the British Army in a territorial unit of the Middlesex Regiment in 1912. He was most likely killed on the 21st of August 1914. On the flip side of the coin, Private George Edwin Elson was the last man to be killed in the Great War, a mere 90 minutes before the official armistice call was sounded. Ellison was 40 years old at the time of his death and survived four long years of trench warfare, including some of the worst fighting at the battles of Ypres and the Somme. To make matters even stranger, he died at the same location of his first ever firefight as part of the British Expeditionary Force retreating from Mons. Really makes you think about how war is just an endless circle. Number 6. Seth MacFarlane and Mark Wahlberg It is a day that almost every American will never forget, September 11th, 2001. A day that almost took the lives of actor and musician Mark Wahlberg and the original creator of the hit animated show Family Guy, actor and comedian Seth MacFarlane, if it wasn't for these oddly specific coincidences. Mark Wahlberg, famous for being a singer and actor, was scheduled to fly on American Airlines Flight 11, the first plane to hit the Twin Towers. Through a last-minute decision to not fly to Los Angeles via New York, but instead to attend a film festival in Toronto, Canada, Wahlberg was able to avoid tragedy. Unfortunately, Wahlberg later received criticism for stating that he would have personally stopped the attacks from happening, saying, quote, If I was on that plane with my kids, it wouldn't have gone down like it did. There would have been a lot of blood in that first-class cabin and then me saying, Okay, we're going to land somewhere safely, don't worry. He later had to attract his comments and apologize for his statements after a public outcry. As for Seth MacFarlane, the coincidence is a bit simpler. While MacFarlane was scheduled to be on the same flight as Wahlberg, he had a few too many drinks the night before and was too hungover to get to the airport in time, missing his flight. That they both managed to avoid the flight ultimately allowed them to make the movie Ted together several years later. Number 5. A Dead Man's Luck Anyone who's purchased a lottery ticket or even one of the cheap scratch-offs you can find at the corner stores has a brief flicker of hope that they will be the one to win that huge jackpot. For one man in 1998, that dream came true, but only after being declared clinically dead for 14 minutes. Bill Morgan from the Australian coastal city of Melbourne. After Morgan suffered a heart attack that left him clinically dead and then comatose for 15 days, he went to a corner store and purchased a $5 scratch-off lottery ticket and won a car worth 30,000 Australian dollars. At the time, no one made a big deal of it until local news channels got wind of the story. The news team wanted to get a shot of Morgan reenacting the original win by having him buy another scratch-off lottery ticket. With a massive stroke of coincidence, Morgan scratched off the winning numbers to reveal that he had won another 250,000 Australian dollars live on broadcast news. Bill is still alive today, and while his original winning video went viral, he is just happy to get the extra years to spend with his wife and even routinely buys the same $5 scratch-off lottery tickets. What are the chances? Do you play lotto or buy scratch-off tickets? Have you ever won anything? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe for more content. Number 4. Plum Pudding a 19th century French poet by the name Emile Deschamps has probably one of the strangest set of coincidences on this list. Now Deschamps is famous for two reasons. The first is his poem La Paix Conquise, written in 1812, which was so highly praised that it even caught Napoleon's notice. The other reason relates to an extremely English dessert, the humble plum pudding. A simple dessert made by combining milk, sugar, port or sherry, breadcrumbs, and of course, plums. This dessert is traditionally enjoyed in the foggy streets of London. An English immigrant to France with the extremely French-sounding name of Monsieur de Forgibou by chance introduces Deschamps to plum pudding when the poet was just a teenager. Years pass and Deschamps is strolling past a cafe in Paris and sees they have plum pudding on the menu. He naturally walks in and orders one, 
However, the cafe had just sold the last one they have on hand to none other than Monsieur de Forgibou. The waiter even asked Forgibou if he was willing to share his plum pudding with Deschamps. Some years come and go, and Deschamps is at a dinner party with his friends, and the host announces the dessert for the evening is plum pudding. As a joke, Deschamps states that Forgibou must be at the party. Just then, without fail, Monsieur de Forgibou rings the doorbell. Forgibou wasn't even supposed to be at that particular dinner party. Just through pure coincidence, he had gotten the wrong address for an event he was in fact invited to. Number 3. True Nature of Solar Eclipses Humans have long been fascinated with the incredible nature of the solar eclipse. The earliest recorded history of this fascination goes back to stone tablets in Babylonia around 2,500 years ago. Eclipses have both started and ended wars, created the backbone of religions, and have even been used to predict the future in the way of both good and bad omens. However, even with their spiritual and sometimes murderous history, they are nothing but a total coincidence. From our current understanding of the celestial duo, the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, and the sun is 400 times the distance from the earth than the moon. According to astronomers at the University of Hertfordshire in the UK, this exact size and distance similarity is the main reason that we're able to see eclipses at all. To add to this coincidence layer cake, because the distances between the Earth and the Moon are always changing, in the next few million years, eclipses will look totally different. The fact that humans are alive at the exact time that the Sun and Moon are the exact distance away that we are able to look up at the heavens and view this strange phenomenon is a coincidence in itself. Number 2. When Life Imitates Art There's an old adage that art often imitates life, and in the case of Edgar Allan Poe's 1838 book, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, that adage proved true, at least in reverse. Poe's book details a horrific tale of survival cannibalism, with a four-man sailing crew getting lost at sea with no food or water, and results in the characters resorting to killing and eating one of the crew members so the remaining crew may live. The character chosen to be eaten was named Richard Parker. The exact story happened in life to a four-man sailing crew taking a small boat named the Mignonette from England to Australia in 1884. The Mignonette had to be taken the long way around because there were unsafe wind conditions in the Mediterranean Sea. Unfortunately for the crew of the Mignonette, they were sunk between the islands of St. Helena and Tristan da Cunha. The crew was left starving in a dinghy, and after three hungry weeks, the cabin boy by the same fateful name of Richard Parker fell ill and the crew killed and ate him. Makes you wonder what books they had on board. Number 1. The First and Last Battles of the Civil War War never changes. While started for a plethora of reasons, they almost always end the same way. The only thing that does change is the locations and weapons. However, in the American Civil War, the same man, Wilmer McLean, got to see the war start on his front lawn and end in his parlor. On the evening of July 18, 1861, a Union cannonball came smashing through McLean's kitchen wall, ruining his fireplace, home, and most importantly, his dinner. This single cannonball was the very beginning of the First Battle of Bull Run. McLean was a successful grocer that inherited a 1,200-acre plantation just south of Washington, D.C. He lived there quite happily with his wife and two daughters before the Confederate soldiers brought the war quite literally to their backyard. As the bulk of the battle was concentrated around his property, McLean and his family relocated to South Central Virginia to safely escape the front lines and rented out the house and barn to Confederate forces. However, the war would follow McLean and his family until the very end. In April of 1865, with Union forces surrounding General Lee and the remaining Confederate forces, they were forced to sign the surrender treaty in the nicest room they could find. The room was McLean's front parlor. Unfortunately for McLean, Union forces stole everything not nailed down in the house, including the very desk the treaty was signed on. McLean was forced to move again and lived the rest of his days as a tax auditor for the IRS until his death in 1882. While war never changes, it without a doubt changed McLean's. The Venice Vampire Skull While excavating a mass grave dating back to the Middle Ages on an island near Venice, 
archaeologists found a strange skull. Not any other skull. It was the skull of a vampire. It had its mouth wide open, with a large slab of rock or a brick forced into its mouth. It was so far back that the jaw was broken. Here's a little backstory to this unusual finding. Female vampires were often blamed for spreading the dreadful plague epidemic throughout Europe. Wedging a rock or brick into the mouth of a suspected vampire was considered as an effective way of preventing it from feeding on the bodies of other plague victims and in turn rising from the grave to attack the living. After researchers dived into the history of the skull, they finally learned that it belonged to an elderly woman who had lived well past the normal age of that time and she was estimated to be between 60 to 71 years old. People in that time usually did not live that long. After her death, it's thought that the people who buried her decided to jam a brick in her mouth, which was often done to bodies people thought could come back as vampires. While the lady probably just lived a healthier life than most, the people around weren't taking any chances. The thought that plague victims might also be vampires arose because blood often dribbled from the mouths of those who died from the disease. It is now believed that she could have also been a witch. This is due to the fact that scientists know that no one really lived past the age of 40 during those times, and anyone who did was thought to have practiced witchcraft in order to extend the life and ultimately cheat death. A year after the excavation, the investigators started looking deeper into who this vampire was and why people may have suspected her of dabbling in the dark arts and even what she might have looked like. It gained so much interest that The Vampire of Venice got her own documentary in the National Geographic series, Mysterious Science, entitled Vampire Forensics. Number 9. Victims Preserved in Bogs Bog bodies are extremely well preserved, and these ancient corpses have been discovered all over northwestern Europe. Bogs mean wetlands, which are found in regions with a temperate climate. The skin of the bog bodies turn into a dark, leathery texture, and their hair turns red from the acidic water and lack of oxygen. Occasionally, the clothing is preserved, and any weapons or ornaments stay with the body. Violently killed thousands of years ago, the bog bodies can be found in various states. Some are merely skeletons and can only reveal a limited amount of information to probing scientists. Others are partially preserved and may still hold some clues as to who they were or how they died. The owners of these bodies sometimes met death in a violent manner and were thrown into the bog. Archaeologists examined the works of a Roman historian from the 1st century AD, where he wrote that the Germans killed weaklings and homosexuals and disposed of the bodies in bogs. Researchers formed the opinion that, rather than weaklings, many of these people were convicted criminals punished by agonizing torture and execution. More typical was the Iron Age funerary custom of creation. The Windeby girl, discovered in a German bog in 1952, was assumed to be an adulteress who was drowned along with her paramour. However, on further investigation of the bodies, they discovered that they were both male and that the other body had been deposited into the bog almost 300 years before the Windeby girl. One of the best preserved bodies found in a bog was discovered in 1952 in an area northwest of Copenhagen. Modern research shows they died at the age of 34 and was sacrificed more than 2,000 years ago. Human sacrifice was common at the time and often followed a natural disaster such as a flood or a destructive storm. According to primitive beliefs, such a disaster was a sign that the gods were angry and a sacrifice was needed to appease them. No one knows for sure how many bog people have been uncovered in the past. Today, documented discoveries of bog bodies number around 700. There are probably many more left undiscovered. Who knows what we may learn about them in the future? When it concerns the bog bodies, archaeologists and anthropologists have redefined their roles as crime scene investigators. Number 8. Screaming Mummies Bodies which are buried in the deep for thousands of years may be found in different states and stages of decomposition or fossilization. After you have unearthed the body, everything looks rather normal, except for the fact that the corpse looks like it is screaming. This has been a reoccurring experience for archaeologists throughout history, and some believe that the bodies would have met disturbing ends. Mummification in ancient Egypt was performed using clearly defined routines and religious rituals. However, an unidentified mummy found in 1881 had not been prepared in accordance with custom. When his body was unwrapped in 1886, archaeologists found themselves confronted with the horrific, gaping maw of a face contorted in a scream. The mummy was in a sarcophagus that did not bear any name or identifying marks. Unable to proceed further, he was called as Unknown Man E and restored in the Kari Museum. One look at the body 
and you will be having nightmares for quite a while. Over 100 years later, a team of Egyptologists, accompanied by National Geographic, reopened the case of Unknown Man E, who became known as the Screaming Mummy. The mummy's identity was rigorously researched because of a startling appearance. However, most Egyptologists agree that the gruesome visage is merely the result of the deceased head falling backwards after death. Archaeologists intend to conduct a DNA test to confirm the familiar connection between the unknown man E and Ramesses III. Do you think mummies scream? Maybe it just lost its voice? We don't have any definite answers to these questions, yet. The screaming mummies will undoubtedly continue to inspire journalists and documentary scriptwriters and many more. How do we know they aren't singing? Number 7. Pits Full of Heads The villagers of China, for decades, believed that the crumbling of rock jade pieces shaped into blades, discs, near their homes were from the Great Wall of China, which was very common along the area. Suspicions grew among the locals as jade was only available at about 1,000 miles away from the area. When a team of Chinese archaeologists came to investigate the rubble, they started unearthing the area and found that the stones weren't a part of the Great Wall, but were the ruins of a magnificent fortress city. The digging revealed a 230 feet high pyramid surrounded by more than 6 miles of protective walls and an inner sanctum containing jade artifacts, painted murals, and gruesome evidence of human sacrifice. The archaeologists had dug up 70 stunning stone sculptures, which were figurines of monsters, serpents, and half-human beasts resembling Bronze Age iconography of China. The site has been named Shimao. It seems Shimao flourished for nearly half a millennium in that remote region, and then suddenly it disappeared. Shimao is forcing historians to rethink the origin of the Chinese civilization. Number 6. The Lloyds Bank Carpolite The Lloyds Bank Carpolite, one of the weirdest discoveries from the Viking Age, is unlike any other find from that time. The weird fossil is, strangely enough, human feces. It is over 8 inches long and 2 inches thick. It is one of the largest human feces ever discovered. It's not hard to feel sorry for the person who squeezed this out. It was densely packed, so much so that it fossilized instead of rotting like normal feces would. Now we can all stare at it and wince with sympathy for the poor person who created it. But here is what further research into this blob of excreta revealed. It contained hundreds of eggs belonging to the whipworm, a parasitic worm which lives in the large intestine. Finds like these are incredibly important because it gives us details into the Viking diet. From this fossil, we understand that whoever created it lived on a diet largely made up of pollen grains and cereal bran, which they would have eaten in the form of bread and porridge. The fossil is named after the place it was discovered and isn't some weird corporate branding exercise. But there's not much known about the person who left it behind, except their diet was rich. The fossil is now on display in the Jorvik Viking Center, UK. Whether the carpolite can be valued as a treasure is a question that has remained for ages. Number 5. The Black Sarcophagus A mysterious black granite sarcophagus, which is approximately 2,000 years old, was discovered in Alexandria, Egypt. The discovery further announced that the massive coffin held the remains of Alexander and that opening the sealed and foreboding looking box would unleash a curse. When opened, the sarcophagus was found to contain only the remains of three Egyptian army officers and a reddish brown sewage liquid. One of the skeletons shows signs of an arrow injury, suggesting the three may have died in battle. The exact age of the skeletons is unclear. No inscriptions or works of art have been found on the outside or inside of the sarcophagus so far. It's also unclear what artifacts, if any, were buried with the skeletons. The sarcophagus was nearly 9 feet long, 5 feet wide, and 6 feet tall. The sarcophagus was never opened after it was buried in Alexandria. The opening of the sarcophagus creates a series of new mysteries for Egyptologists. Who were these three people? When exactly did they live? What killed them? Why were they buried in such a giant sarcophagus? What were they buried with? And how did so much liquid sewage get into the sarcophagus? Do we know all these answers yet? Unfortunately, no. But scientists are working towards uncovering some hidden truth. Archaeologists believe that it could date back to sometime between 304 BC and 30 BC, a time when the descendants of one of Alexander the Great's generals ruled Egypt. Number 4. The very first leper. When archaeologists were digging in India, they found something startling. Archaeologist experts usually find various traces of where life once was, but rarely do they come across something so rare as a disease like this. They discovered evidence of leprosy in a skeleton that was 4,000 years old. 
It was not only the oldest skeleton that had been found, but it was with traces of leprosy. It was also the first case of leprosy found in India. Leprosy is very difficult to trace and study. While leprosy is curable now, there was no treatment for the disease 4,000 years ago, and lepers were often ostracized by their communities. The investigations have shed light on how the disease might have spread in early human history. Historical sources support an initial spread of the illness from Asia to Europe, with Alexander the Great's army behaving as the vector after 400 BC. The newly discovered skeleton was buried around 2000 BC in Rajasthan, India, at the site of Balathal. Though it is no longer a significant public health threat in most parts of the world, leprosy is still one of the least understood infectious diseases. Number 3. A Creepy Tiny Hand Archaeologists unearthed a creepy, child-sized, life-life miniature bronze hand at the Roman fort of Vindolanda near Hadrian's Wall in England. The hand was found near a temple devoted to the god of Jupiter Dolichenus. The cult of Jupiter Dolichenus is shrouded in a mystery, whose practices were further shrouded in secrecy. It died out before the adoption of Christianity in the main region of the empire. The cult was very popular in the Roman army of the 3rd century CE. Researchers are stating the age of the hand to be between 208 and 212 AD. The hand was likely left as an offering after a major invasion of Scotland, in which a huge number of people may have been killed. The 4-inch hand originally had a socket and would have been fixed to a pole, which is now missing. Jupiter Dolichenus was typically depicted holding a thunderbolt in his hand, with an upraised arm signifying his destructive power, according to experts. The open hand also symbolizes protection and well-being. So, what is your take on this? Does it sound creepy or not? Number 2. Skeletons of Twins A bioarchaeologist says she has discovered the oldest set of confirmed twins during her field research in a Siberian cemetery. The discovery says the exhumed skeletons of a mother and her twins are around 7,700 years old. It says a sad story of a woman who partially delivered one twin in a breech position, which obstructed the birth of the second child. It is impossible to say for sure that there were twins in the past, said Leavers, who added that while archaeologists have found babies buried together in the same grave, it doesn't necessarily prove the existence of twins. But finding the twins' bones inside the mother confirms them as the oldest set in the world. The mother, who was between 20 and 25 years old, probably bled to death or died from exhaustion and was likely unaware that she was carrying twins. This find is the earliest confirmed set of human twins on record. The fact that the first baby came breech was just a death sentence for all three of them. Number 1. Skeletons Placed in a Circle Last but far from least, one of the most troubling examples of human sacrifice comes from Peru. At the ancient site of Pachacamac, 80 skeletons were found arranged in very peculiar ways, with all feet pointing to the center of a circle and were estimated to be buried around thousands of years ago. These skeletons were placed in the fetal position and consisted of bones of very young people which were circled in a Peruvian tomb, some of which had false and wooden heads. It is named as one of the creepiest discoveries ever made. Simply because of the way the bones were arranged, it was believed that it was the resting place for pilgrims who had come for miraculous cures and didn't get what they expected. It is also assumed that some people might have died naturally. It is considered the largest find of human remains at Pachacamac, and it continues to baffle archaeologists and researchers. Archaeologists helped demystify these seemingly bizarre remnants of the past. In doing so, they also do the incredibly important work of helping humanity learn from history, rather than being doomed to repeat it, human sacrifice and all. Which of these creepy discoveries give you a spine-chilling moment? Let us know about it in the comment section, and do come back soon for another shocking video. Don't forget to hit subscribe, and thanks for watching.